Alrighty, what is up, everybody? Coming at you hot, despite my internet being absolutely dog shit. I'm gonna be trying to get through a stream with y'all today, so I'm just gonna quickly come out and say Merry Christmas. This is my Christmas special, I guess you could say. It's been about a month since I've uploaded solely because of internet and technical difficulties, but I'm coming at you hot. So I'm sorry for the terrible lighting. It looks like fucking fairyland in here. The shit is just absolutely lit up. So apologies for streaming from uh, Tropical Paradise, but that's just how things are here. But uh, today is, of course, a religious holiday. First and foremost, I mean, we could talk about gift giving and family and all this other stuff, but the real reason people have Christmas in the first place is to celebrate the birth of Christ. So essentially what we're looking at is a commercialized religious holiday. And it's really fascinating getting into the history of Christmas, the history of uh, Santa Claus and all this other stuff. Sorry for the last minute adjustments. And kind of realizing that what we celebrate today is honestly an appropriation of a religious saint, like Saint Nicholas, a Turkish born, or not Turkish born, an Anatolian born literal person who was sanctified by the Catholic Church due to his giving away of his material possessions despite being born in wealth and going and helping out the needy and the sick and the downtrodden. So, of course, he got his few miracles down, got his beautification, all this other stuff, and became a saint. Well, apparently, as we know, as time marches on somewhere during the 8th century and onwards, that began to become syncretic with many pagan traditions, the Latin tradition of Saturnalia, many types of solstice worship or observation by various cultures, whether they be uh, Christian or pagan or even Jewish. Uh, you have celebration of Hanukkah, which coincides also with the time of the solstice. So we see this all across cultures where the winter solstice especially holds significant meaning for many of these people. So as you well know, the critique through history is based off a period by period, timeline by timeline, hardcore dissection of what people are currently being taught in schools. So the reason that I specifically focus in, on arguments against evolutionism and materialism is because that's the status quo, because academia has been taken over by militant atheism and left-wing ideology, which has been the case since the 60s, let's just be honest, this has been what's being pushed, a secularized, sanitized view of the origins of our universe that are not tied to scientific principles of rigorous scientific method or mathematical analysis, but purely just a conjecture, purely inference. And people forget that the process of deductive and inductive reasoning that is the scientific method falls not only upon observation, but also inference. The interpretation of the data you gather and the observations you have test against a hypothesis. Whether it accepts or rejects the new hypothesis is basically where you're at. It's an if-then statement. If I grow a tomato in, I don't know, volcanic soil versus desert soil, then it'll grow better in the volcanic soil than the desert soil. Then you test that out. You have a tomato plant that you plant in some sand imported from the Sahara Desert, put it under a heat lamp. You take some soil that you imported from Tahiti, put it in there, put it under a heat lamp. And then as a control, you take some soil from your garden and place it there and see how it compares against normal soil conditions. And you test it out, and oh, lo and behold, it grows better in the volcanic soil than it does in the desert soil. And that would be a way to test it. And then you test it not only three plants, but 30 plants. Not only 30 plants, but 300 plants. And that's how you get actual scientific data. So the reason I critique evolution, evolution is a random gene mutation as the primary justification reason for the diversity of life on Earth that we see and just life in general, is precisely because it's non-scientific. Because we see that throughout all of our models predicting, okay, how, how is this organism going to change? How many mutations does it take to change? We don't see radical macroevolution just because of empty niches, just because of a mass extinction opens up a lot of possibilities when these possibilities are going to be fulfilled. 
purely because the mechanism for change is not environmental. The environmental conditions may cause epigenetic alterations to an animal. It might induce uh, the urge of adaptation or they'll respond to it, which is the bedrock of natural selection. However, the actual mechanism for speciation and change for both plants and animals is random gene mutation. Certain animals like Drosophilans already have mechanisms in place, multiple mechanisms in place that pre prevent radical change to the genome from taking place. We see that in certain lineages, such as the um, horseshoe crabs and also the coelacanth, that along with frilled shark, along with eels, along with everything from dragonflies to what, bees? Like, like lineages that can trace even birds. I think birds emerging in the in the late Jurassic or even for possibly earlier than maintaining forms that are recognizable to us today for 160 million years. I think that's pretty convincing, even though we do see an abundance of bird species. We see this template already. So this idea that we see as pervasive is times where, for some reason or another, we see massive radical change to the physiology, niche, lifestyle, life history, etc., of lineages in just a handful of millions of years. And you might think a million years is a long, long time, but keep in mind that if, okay, modern humans, anatomically modern humans have been around for 300,000 years or so, based off the earliest found in Morocco from 330,000 years of an anatomically modern human. So we know that anatomically modern humans have been around for, let's say, one third of a million years. Okay, so when you get to, for example, 7 million years, this is a famous example pointed out between chimps and humans, that, we, that we're that we supposedly 7 million years removed between us and the nearest chimp common ancestor. However, when you see that there's 40 million base pair differences between humans and chimps, know that mutation often happens uh, sporadically. Sometimes it's positive change, sometimes it's neutral, and it takes a while for that to reach fixation. You're seeing that in order for these 40 million base pair differences, 20 million at each side to reach fixation in whatever population, you have a chromosome difference between the two, all of this. How is that supposed to happen in one individual by random mutation and then somehow reach fixation throughout the whole population? Like how is reducing your karyotype, like how, is, how is losing a chromosome so beneficial to humanity that even in a bottleneck situation, it reaches fixation in all humans. If it's only one person, what's the likelihood of this happening? Like what principle, like genetic drift doesn't show us that that happens. If you lose a chromosome, like how the hell does that translate? So either chimpanzees gained a chromosome, which is not what uh, modern academics are actually pushing. They're trying to push that. We lost a chromosome like 100,000 to 75,000 years ago, or let's say 120 to 100,000 years ago. But it's like, the hell are these people talking about? They're talking about human beings undergoing a radical change in our genome, such as losing a chromosome, in order for us to be compatible with the idea of chimpanzee descent. And that's not scientific. That's based solely on assumption. There's no real justification for this. This discrepancy between human beings and chimps, if we're so related, I mean, shit, you can interbreed bison and cattle and produce hybrid offspring, and they diverged around that same time period. So the aurochs is what we come from. And so it's like, go back 7 million years and all the bovids can still interbreed from one another being millions of years out. But you go back to this time and they're trying to convince us that human beings are basically chimpanzees and that modern human beings and chimps diverged 7 million years ago. Well, even if you split those base pair differences down the middle, that's 44 unique gene mutations per generation to get to us. And the more mutations you stack on with each generation, the less likely that that individual is going to pass on their genes. Because we know from looking at all of the data that the majority of mutations are either going to be utterly neutral and not affect the genome, or they're going to be harmful. And only a small percentage of mutations are actually beneficial. So statistically speaking, it doesn't check out for all of these mutations to just roll along. And that radical mutation is going to somehow, some way, just become fixed in the whole population. Like you would have to have back-to-back -back insanely good mutations for that to occur. But we're seeing that creatures from ichthyosaurs to whales from their hoofed ancestors, uh, it's not just human beings. You're seeing it all throughout, from lungfish to tulpidon. They're getting aquatic lungfish to terrestrial amphibians in just 15 million years. 
it's like this shape shifting you see everywhere. But the alternative hypothesis that these people have been fighting against their whole careers, the reason that people believe in abiogenesis, that life forms can just randomly assemble themselves from soup, basically, is creationism. So creationism is the big thing that all these scientists are trying to disprove or actively reject when they try to talk about stuff like this slightly lower, it doesn't have to go all the way. So when they talk about stuff like speciation, when they talk about things like uh, abiogenesis or spontaneous generation, I should be messing with this, then what we see is that all of these are specifically tailored to try to get rid of arguments that they find to be uncomfortable when talking about the origins of the universe. They don't see creationism as scientific because creationism hinges on the existence of a creator deity or entity or, or intelligent being to fundamentally create the physical reality we see around us. So life being created out of dust, out of the word of an entity or collectively created is seen as backwards and barbaric because in the enlightenment, they thought of theological mind, mindset as erroneous after discovering that, oh, the earth revolves around the sun and that we uh, distant stars are just suns in general. Once they peeled back the layers and saw that there was more to the universe than what the Bible and then what theology could explain, once they realized that, oh, well, religious texts are not only woefully inadequate to explain the universe, that might even be wrong about the universe, then people started moving towards a direction of secularism and humanism during the Enlightenment era. So that is basically has its roots in the 17th century and went all the way to the 19th century. So during the settlement and colonialism and all of this, in the backdrop, and what people don't realize is that the Age of Enlightenment was underway, and the secularization of academic institutions was also well underway. You saw everyone from Anton Lavoisier to Isaac Newton in this era. This was the era of science. This was the era that scientific method was truly developed. But still, despite this, the majority of the scientists and mathematicians working in this era were all creationists. So interestingly enough, though, the very people, even including Char Charles Darwin, who actually uh, put down the groundwork for modern secularist materialist thinking about the universe were established by theological creationists who were using the scientific method to explain the world around them, but not going that extra step further into conjecture to establish, oh, this is the origins of the universe. It wasn't until the mid 20th century. It wasn't until actually you got guys like Richard Dawkins or Carl Sagan and guys in the latter half of the 20th century coming out and trying to say, oh, the, the Big Bang and da 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 da. It's like, this is, this is the high tr high alternative religion to creationism. But they paint it as science. It's science to say that the world's going to end in 25 years because of changing weather even when it doesn't happen, even when it's nowhere near the conditions or as dire of a situation as you think it is, you still claim that you're scientific. But in reality, it's just an alternative theory, an alternative hypothesis, and isn't really grounded in the scientific method. Now, alternatively, there's creationism, there is evolutionism, and then there's a couple other options. One is the Anunnaki hypothesis. Now, to those unfamiliar with the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki are said to be a highly intelligent race of beings that came down to the planet during the Neolithic and effectively started every single major civilization in history. They're essentially tied to the ideas of the pre-Adamic race and concepts from the Book of Enoch, and they're merged with ancient Sumerian and Mesopotamian religion and are tied to things such as the flood myth and common threads between uh, Abrahamic religions, Near Eastern religions, uh, Central Asian religions, uh, things like Zoroastrianism, and Buddhism, and even universal concepts across religions. They are said to be the creators of humanity. And the reason I use the Anunnaki hypothesis is because it is a form of intelligent design that relies not on a singular creator or pantheon of gods that are somewhat abstract or removed from reality, but rather es essentially extraterrestrials that came down and specifically genetically engineered humans 
and many life forms on this planet, potentially even gardening this planet from its earliest stages. So there's that. And if you talk, look at UFOs, if you look at UFAs, this is actually gaining popularity over time. This is one of the alternative hypotheses, probably that's growing the fastest if you exclude uh, religious convergence or um, conversion or natural growth through births. So in terms of actual pure converts, I still think that maybe creationism has this beat, but I've genuinely seen more buzz for panspermia, which is the other version. It's the weakest version of this, which is I, I include in another one. But the Anunnaki hypothesis is probably growing faster than anything else. The idea that either it is the Anunnaki, which doesn't have to be the case, people still think that extraterrestrials may have something to do with our creation. Then there is, of course, what I just mentioned, panspermia. The idea that macroevolution is correct, but that there was no abiogenesis, that spontaneous generation was still disproved by Louis Pasteur, and that instead of spontaneous generation, you have a asteroid or meteor, either from Mars or from some other planet, actually seeding the Earth with life when water was brought from uh, further out afield. So there's that, which is like a softer version that still believes in macroevolution, but does not believe in abiogenesis. Then you have yet another one. This one has to deal with uh, forces within humanity, like the mana hypothesis, that similar to people in Polynesia or similar to peoples in Austronesia, like the Australian Aboriginals or people from Papua New Guinea, that the human spirit itself, that the breath of life itself is itself a conscious entity that induces change. So with the mana hypothesis, life itself is directing and conscious. So it's almost like the tail wagging dog or not necessarily, I think that's a bit more derisive, but it's basically the deus ex machina, the God within the machine, that life itself emulates concepts that are prevalent in animism or even in mainstream religions like Christianity with the Holy Spirit. But it's a more animistic view of life, that life is altering itself and has conscious direction of itself. And that as a whole, life is behaving almost like a conscious organism, that all life itself is connected and essentially is one living thing as a whole. So that's also, I think, called the Gaia hypothesis that the earth is alive and that life itself is an extension of the earth's consciousness. So I think possibly like, uh, I think the Gaia hypothesis about a living earth is probably, that probably is encompassed within the Gaia hypothesis. I think at the bottom of that rabbit hole is the Gaia hypothesis. So you have the Gaia hypothesis, you have the Anunnaki hypothesis, you have panspermia, you have creationism, you have materialism. The sixth version, which you will see, is potentially more in line with the Gnostics. And that's that life is, life is ultimately designed, that of course life is designed, but that the creator of the universe is not the, the center of the universe. That instead of the creative designer being... Uh, being the, the ultimate true God, that there is a deeper and poten potentially multidimensional aspect to our universe that goes far beyond just a question of life, but even reality. So I guess there's a Gnostic way of viewing things that's like the sixth way, but if you, unless you're extra edgy, then I'm just going to stick to this five, because that essentially is just creationism with extra steps. And in my research, I don't really count it. So how do we break this apart going forward? So the reason I'm bringing this up anyway is because I've said before in my critique through history that I'm not going to get into questions of how and why. I'm just trying to dissect what people have said and analyze the things that people are saying is the truth and having my own opinion on if it's true or not. Uh, the issues with presenting this as the truth and nothing but the truth, because evolutionism at the end of the day, despite what people might think about, oh, how supported is it, and how isn't, you know, how not supported is it? At the end of the day, it's just one of at least four serious competing hypotheses for what created life on Earth. 
So first and foremost, what do they say? They think that RNA started out very basic and that self-assembling RNA effectively was able to, through configuration, through random assemblage of base pairs of nucleotide bases, was able to find a form that could self-replicate. And that miraculously, this was surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer and given the protected conditions in order to make more of itself. And that through slight alterations in the RNA genome, it switched from RNA to DNA at some point in time, but reserved RNA as a template in order to express genes or create proteins in ribosomes that came from somewhere, that came from other RNA being folded together. And one quick, I mean, I pointed out before how quickly that just is completely torn apart, just torn to shreds. Abiogenesis has not been achieved in any laboratory because trying to convince us that RNA self-assembled not only into a readable genome that can create proteins, but also uh, into a ribosome, uh, configure itself three ways and fit together perfectly to create proteins and string together amino acids and miraculously gain all the genomic information to survive, maintain homeostasis from chemicals. It's disproven. It's not even just improbable. It was disproven by Louis Pasteur that in nature, we don't see this, that only life can beget life. So already abiogenesis has been just as debunked as panspermia. In fact, less so, because in panspermia, life is still beginning life. It's just not answering the question of, okay, well, where did that life come from? It's just concerned with life on earth. If you look at it, statistical probability dictates that mm, panspermia actually has not been disproven by science but spontaneous generation has. Similarly, if you look at the Anunnaki hypothesis, it also doesn't explain this because it doesn't say the Anunnaki seeded life on earth, it's just that the Anunnaki are responsible for human creation. But if we extend the Anunnaki hypothesis to include life on earth, that could just be seen as a form of panspermia. So panspermia and creationism and evolutionism, or rather I'll say materialism, these all three compete to explain the origins of life and also the universe. Panspermia doesn't explain where the universe came from. When it comes to the Big Bang, unless you believe in like Yggdrasil and the fucking world tree, then you, or the turtle that is holding up the universe, then you're probably either going to believe that um, God, a dude in the sky, or an interdimensional cosmic overlord, or some other entity pantheon of gods even created the entire universe or even think that the universe itself is the god is the entity that everything comes out of but the other competing hypothesis is that the universe randomly came out of nowhere that it big bangs that the universe was essentially basically a singularity and that it expanded within the blink of an eye to encompass the universe, which is just I don't understand, again, why people are so afraid to call this a religion. Because to me, that sounds like religion. That doesn't sound like anything you can test or prove. Oh, my background radiation. And the only proof they have of this is looking at the background radiation of the universe from the center of a galaxy. Like, you do realize you're in a galaxy bathed in radiation, right? Why do you think you, it was like, oh, this is the universal background radiation? Like, no, it's not. What the fuck are you saying that? You're, you're taking this data from low Earth orbit in a satellite. I covered this in another one of my uh, streams, but it's like the, the data they have for universal background radiation is taken from low Earth orbit. Motherfucker, you, you don't know what the background radiation looks like, so they just pull shit out of their ass to justify saying that the universe came from a point? Came from, came from a what? That the universe was packed into a ball, and then where did that come from? And then it's just mental gymnastics. It's like at least religious people, at least creationists can say, oh, God did it. But these motherfuckers are like doing handstands and backflips and scissor kicks and shit to try to explain away like where the universe came from. Because, again, they're trying to compete with creationism. They're not trying to be scientific like Enlightenment era scientists were. They're trying to actively replace religion. So this is why they're they're always hemmed in. This is why atheism has failed to be a gotcha for Christians and for Muslims and for Buddhists this entire time. This is why you saw the golden age of Islam and 
very little effect of Islam because you can't replace religion with science. You just can't because science is unable to actively answer these questions that go so deep in time that we don't have enough data to answer it. I mean, once you even leave the, the solar system, there's data deficient, like learning about the heliopause and how wrong we were about the heliopause when Voyager crossed it. That was a huge watershed moment for physics. And it's hardly ever talked about that scientists were dead fucking wrong about the physical properties of the sun's heliopause. The actual magnetic field of the sun was completely different than what we predicted it was going to be at the edge of our solar system. Completely threw uh, physicists for a loop and has thrown completely into question everything we know about physics outside of our solar system. We can't even get it right about our own fucking star. And yet we're out here talking about how stars are made in the formation of black holes. Shit's redonkulous. But the hubris of modern science says like, oh, this is all scientific. But they refuse to admit that they're just making shit up as they go along. That's why so many people are walking away from academia because when you make shit up as you go along, that's fine if you're just some fucking physicist talking about cartoon balls. But when you're out here telling people the world's going to end in 15 years and telling people on Vanuatu, oh, you better uh, translate your, uh, you know, transfer your entire population to Australia or you're going to die. And then having none of that fucking happen, like, bro, you almost ethnically cleansed a Pacific island because of climate change fear mongering. So you go, you fly out in your fucking private jets and get frozen to the tarmac going to talk about how the weather's heating up. And meanwhile, the Anunnaki people are seen as schizos. Panspermiists are seen as some fringe nerds. Creationists are seen as ignorant Bible thumpers. And God forbid, Gnostics are just seen as edgelords, which they are. But it's like you've denigrated all these other alternative hypotheses. And I'm sure much more abound. I just haven't been able to see any others that are mainstream that aren't just other religions. Like you've denigrated and down demoted all of these other ideologies as just being ignorant which I don't see, I, I don't see how that's fair. Like you believe that the world came from nothing. And so the fuck, like, who are you to say that this is ridiculous? So creationist, creationism, what are the merits of creationism? So I've been clear about my disdain for evolutionism being taught as fact. Yet now we see creationism also taught as fact for centuries be on the other foot after the Enlightenment era basically proved that there's more to the world than the Bible. And this is a fundamental truth. I'm sorry, creationists, the world is not 6,000 years old. Young Earth creationism is the flat Earth, flat Earth bullshit that plagues modern Christianity, I think, to this day. And I'm sure that uh, every religion, Islam has them, Buddhism has them, they all have overly simplistic retards that refuse to believe that there's anything more to the world than what the Vedas say, or refuse to believe there's anything more in the world than what these old gurus mentioned. And it's very clear from the Bible that there's just a lot of facts omitted, fam. There's just a lot of shit out there that is just not mentioned in the Bible. And for that reason alone, people who are Christian have been relying on science to fill in those gaps. That's what originally what it was for. It's like, well, the Bible doesn't talk about shit genetics. So, like, let's look into that, fam. Like, uh, apparently there's more to the world than... You know, what's mentioned there are just straight up non-truths that are in there, assumptions that turns out when we actually look at empirical data, turn out not to be the facts. However, when it comes to the idea of an intelligent designer, of a creator God, that in and of itself is a matter of faith. Because you can look at, around at the complexity of the world and be like, yo, oh, hey, DZ, sup, fam, Merry Christmas, Merry so you can look around at the world and marvel at it. You can look at the beauty of the planet and its complexities and think that there has to be something more to this. But does that something more to this have to be a god, a singular deity? Does it have to be the Jewish god or the Muslim god or the Christian god? And it's like, does it have to be Krishna? Does it have to be a giant turtle? Does it have to be the skull of some giant that was slain by some epic warrior in the past? It's like... This is the issue with creationism, is that, again, you're putting the, the wagon before the horse. This is why it's a system of faith. This is why scientists in the past, despite, uh, in the past, despite being Christian, use science to fill in the gaps and fill in holes in their understanding. Because you can't just walk outside and say, this is God. You can't. 
That's the difficult thing. That's why trying to disprove creationism has been an abysmal failure. Because likelihood dictates, if you purely use logic, it, looking at a genome, looking at life, looking at the complexity and the order of things despite entropy, you can't, you can't say how the world got to an ordered place in order to experience entropy. You have to see that just as much entropy, even more entropy, has been reversed than has actually been generated. It's like Sisyphus. How is the, if you have entropy, you have to explain how does a rock roll downhill if it wasn't somehow put uphill in the first place? This is what materialism and evolutionism has been trying to tap dance around since its inception. And early Enlightenment era scientists and thinkers and philosophers realized this. Okay, we see a rock rolling downhill. Isaac Newton explained in the second law of thermodynamics, again, Isaac Newton, an Enlightenment age thinker, explained how does a rock roll downhill? Gravity. Obviously, we know that when something is placed at a high place, there's two forms of energy, gravitational potential energy and then gravitational kinetic energy. Gravitational potential energy is simply the energy stored in the probability that an object will experience fall. So by moving in a different place in the gravitational field, unless it's obstructed or held up by mass, it will experience gravitational kinetic energy. Fancy pants words saying, pull out floor, thing fall. So if I suddenly, if, if, if the building I was in hoofed out of existence and beneath me was a giant crater, I would fall into said crater. Without some physical mass pushing against my mass, I would fall towards the center of the planet. That's gravity. But in order to experience that in energetic, in order to experience that energetic displacement, I have to be in a place where I experience high gravitational potential energy. That's the same for entropy. In order to experience entropy, in order to have energy converted into heat, you have to have energy in the first place. Where did all of that energy come from? How did we have a positive balance that can experience entropy without a universe that was somehow first created. We have to violate one of the most core laws of our universe, that matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transmuted and transferred into one another in order to get the current conditions of the universe. The universe would have to break its own rules to create itself, which is inherently flawed. So we know that trying to explain the universe that way is impossible. But trying to explain the universe as something emerging from a multiverse, which is what they're trying to do now, if you listen to Hawking's, or I think even Sagan and Dawkins approach this, is that a multiverse led to the creation of our universe. That two universes, I guess, smashed, and a universe baby was born in the form of our universe, which is what they unironically kind of believe now. Or that an outside entity created the universe, that a being be above and beyond the universe created the physical universe we live in. That's the only way we can, we can address this entropy question. And that's raw science. That's what many scientists in the early days, you'd think like, oh, they would learn about all this science and they ditch all of this religious concept. But in the words of Werner Heisenberg, the first sip of a glass of science will make you an atheist, but at the bottom you'll find God. Because the uncomfortable truth about our universe is that all signs point to the fact that shit, this motherfucker had to come from somewhere, and we're not sure what it is. We're not sure if it's a sky daddy. We're not sure if it's a cosmic entity. We're not sure if it's a, a dimensional hole. We're not sure if it's a computer simulation. I mean, this universe could come from any number of origins. And the only reason I haven't mentioned the computer simulation one is because it's silly and the least likely of all possibilities, but still possible. The fact that we could all be living in a fucking computer simulation is not lost on me. The fact that we could all just be the slumbering imagination of some eldritch entity is also not lost on me. We could all just be living one giant lucid dream and be floating in a tub of fluid like the Matrix. I mean, that's all possible, bro. Like, that's the craziest thing about our universe, is once you deprogram yourself from evolutionist materialist bullshit, what you realize is that anything is possible. And they don't want you to think that anything is possible. The government doesn't want you to think anything's possible. Schools don't want you to think anything is possible. They want you to be a drone. They want you to pay your taxes, work your nine to five. You'll live in the pod. You'll eat your bugs. You'll get a vasectomy and go on birth control. And if you do manage to squeeze out a kid, you're going to, 
you know, chop its balls off and tell them it's a she and go by pronouns and then adopt a dog. That's what they want. This is what they want. Then you'll fucking work a nine to five and then retire and die. And the cycle will repeat until the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor. And the sun burns itself out in whatever million years they predict it's going to burn itself out. That's just how it is. So the modern universe that we see around us can be boiled down to just random boom. Uh, life assembled itself. Life has no meaning. Emotions are just chemicals in your brain. Get over it. And that's all a deliberate agenda. I mean, if you actually look at the origins of atheism, it all begins with Judaism and the Frankfurt School and a large amount of Bolsheviks and communists that came together out of these schools and universities in the early 20th century in Central Europe in places like Germany, places like Austria, places like Poland. And when I talk about this time period during, before and after World War I, people get very uncomfortable. Materialism, exactly. And not just consumerism, but another ideology beginning with the C, communism. Because the biggest pushers of atheism and agnosticism and even consumer so capital, capitalism is combined with consumerism but under a communist system everyone is just a consumer you're boiled down to simple terminology and phrases when you remove an institution of religion and replace it with materialism you're no longer a human being you're just an animal you're just a an upright ape you're just a statistic you're just a consumer of resources. So your humanity has now been removed and you're instead just seen as an animal. They removed the dichotomy between man and animal. They removed the dichotomy between man, uh, man and woman. They removed the dichotomy between, uh, oh, not, of course not rich and poor. Of course not rich and poor. And of course not between the races. But they'll, because they have to keep us divided after all. They have to, First of all, they have to put us in our place, let us know that they're the haves and we're the have-nots. But then we're, they're also going to create division because they don't want us too united. We don't, we don't want the have-nots too, too united, so we're going to break things down in terms of identity. But we don't want you to have a god. We want you to believe in black, white, and polka-dotted and all this, but we don't want you to believe in a god because that could unite you too much. But materialism absolutely does push people towards consumerism. It, I find that materialism is simply just a tool, just like how abortion is a eugenic tool uh, for communists and leftists to reduce the global population. You look at the WEF and the Georgia Guidestones, they want to reduce the human population to by 90%. They wanted only 800 million people on Earth at a time where there are barely even 7 billion people on Earth. So they want to literally decimate, reverse decimate even the human population. They want us down to only 10% of our total numbers. And the World Economic Forum and the G7 Summit and all of these globalist organizations and international corporations, they push this. They push climate change agenda. They push materialism because that's how they get ahead. They will never admit that they call Anunnaki hypothesis, the Gaia hypothesis, panspermia. They call it all bullshit. They're like, oh, well, that's ridiculous. That's all fanciful imaginations. When... The likelihood of us being intelligently designed by an alien race to explain the differences of humanity and admitting that we know of unidentified aerial phenomenon and unidentified flying objects, pretty fucking damning. I think it's a pretty fair shot to say that aliens or extra-dimensional beings or some higher entities might be involved in our creation compared to, oh, oh, it's, it's all random. We just randomly came out of soup and then we randomly became this and then we randomly became amphibian and we randomly became it's like randomly we became xyz and the old and the old mckenna quote of give me one miracle and i'll explain the rest is prevalent with evolutionism and materialism the universe came from nothing so the positive balance that we have in the universe the reverse entropy phenomenon that occurred that broke the laws of physics to even happen in the first place happened by the uh, happened because how and they can't explain it. They just say Big Bang happened. Big Bang go bird. And it's like they just put their fingers in there like, oh, Big Bang, Big Bang, Big Bang. 
I'm like, I get it if your parents abused you. I, I don't, I'm sorry you got molested by a Catholic priest, but that doesn't suddenly make your argument about the universe coming from nothing more legitimate than somebody thinking that an intelligent race designed humanity or that life came from a meteor. The nigga who says life came from a meteor, honestly, 100% has more logic to his claim than the motherfucker who believes that we came from tide pools and uranium exposure. The motherfucker that believes that life randomly assembled on Earth sounds like he's smoking crack next to somebody who just thinks that we arrived on a, on a meteor. So somebody who, a kid, a 10 year old kid who played Spore and now unironically thinks that humans came in on a comet is 100% smarter and has 50 IQ points above somebody who believes in the, it, that just tells me you're programmed. If you think life came from soup, you are an NPC. It, that is the definition of programming because I don't know how the fuck you can listen to alternative theories that have nothing to do with your sky daddy that have nothing to do with your spaghetti monster and be like, nope, it couldn't be extraterrestrials. Nope, it couldn't be beings from outer space. Nope, it couldn't be a meteor. It has to be this. You're a fucking idiot. Because if you're objectively scientific, then you would know, statistically speaking, it's way more likely that an alien created life on Earth or that a meteor brought life on Earth here than it is for, for it to randomly assemble. You fucking know that shit. We, we brought life to the fucking moon in the form of fucking tardigrades and microbes. So what the fuck are you saying? We already have a scientifically verified example of life being accidentally introduced to a, to a satellite body, but you're over here trying to tell us that life fucking conjured itself out of the ether like some fucking Mickey Mouse cartoon, like some fucking Disney special from Fantasia where just like tap, 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 and about like a bunch of magical brooms, cells popped out of the fucking soup. It's some hydrothermal vent. Like, give me a fucking break. That has never happened before or since. And yet we're supposed to believe that life randomly generated itself compared to all these other theories. So already the alternative theories to abiogenesis are fucking strong as hell. As a matter of fact, even creationism has a hard time arguing against panspermia and, uh, and Gaia hypothesis. I mean, shit, the idea that life itself is an intelligent force and that Gaia hypothesis struggles with the sole fact that it can explain how life acts or may have an idea during life's existence, but then what created life? The guy hypothesis still doesn't explain how life was created. Life has to exist to perpetuate life. So again, life has to come from somewhere. And Louis Pasteur in science definitively proved that. I bang on and on, but he decisively proved that only life can beget life. That is the fundamental principle of biology. If you are a biologist or study biology and you do not know the very principle notion of biology and one of the most fundamental aspects of biology what it means to be a life form is that only life can be get itself then you're slacking you literally do not go to school you must have been smoking weed and skipping class if you did not remember that fact but only life can be get life spontaneous generation was one of the first things we had to disprove in order to go forward with scientific advancement proving that oh maggots don't just show up in the flesh they have to be laid there by flies You'd think that that's something simple, but it's something that took forever for people to realize that animals have to breed more of themselves. They won't just magically appear out of the soil. So already we see that with cells that already disproved abiogenesis over a century before people were really trying to push it. And they're psyoping people being like, this isn't spontaneous generation. I'm like, yes, it fucking is. How is this not spontaneous generation? Where's the life that came before the life? It, there isn't any. So you're saying that it's spontaneous generation. But nothing has actually disproven panspermia or the Hananaki hypothesis or Gaia hypothesis simply kicks the can down the road. The only theory that actually definitively tries to explain the origins of life that actually tells us, oh, it wasn't just transported from somewhere else is creationism. That ultimately either... So the alien life form tied to this universe had itself they had to be created. But if you're looking at an extra dimensional or super dimensional being creating the universe, then suddenly we have an actual answer. The only ideology that actively answers where did life come from in the universe is actually creationism. The pan Gaius respond saying that life itself is a cosmic force and that where the potential for life exists, then life will be created by the gestalt of life. So, that implies, but what is that? Like, what is the entity driving force that kindles that spark? Is it akin to cosmic lightning striking a forest fire? 
Is the fire of life kindled by some energetic event that sets the Gaia hypothesis into action? Or is it a active conscious being creating it? Or even a combination of the two, that the active conscious being creating life in the universe is itself a reflection of life in the universe. That by simply existing, that life has to exist in some capacity. It's the sort of the universe is aware because we exist type of shit that Sagan and Dawkins were trying to push. So already you can see the mental gymnastics. The Gaia people, the Panspermian people, and the Anunnaki people, along with the materialists, struggle to explain the origins of the universe. You have other people trying to say now that, oh, the multiverse theory. So multiverses. Now we think that, or rather, especially Hawkins before he died, bought into this. He was like, and we think that the multiverse is the ultimate answer to the origins of our universe. And he sits up there like a fucking flesh puppet while his masters dictate his voice to speech. But again, it's still a tantalizing alternative hypothesis or theory to Big Bang. Because the multiverse theory is not the same as the Big Bang. So the very godfather of the Big Bang ended up trying to find an alternative hypothesis to the Big Bang before his death because he could not answer about where the universe came from. So DZ says, there are studies about humans and innate belief in a higher power. I believe the researchers tested young children from all around the world and all of them believe in God and the afterlife. So it's a very interesting dimension because it doesn't take a huge leap of faith to understand that there's something greater than ourselves in the universe. I think this innate knowledge, many psychologists try to boil it down to, oh, it's seeing natural phenomena like lightning or storms and understanding their uh, natural powers outside of our control. And then assuming that that goes up the ladder all the way into space and into the cosmos. And I just think that it's, it's really, really just a no brainer. When you think about the fact that we're a bunch of, I mean, according to them, we're a bunch of bald apes on a blue speck flying through the galaxy at tens of thousands of miles per hour. We're just along for the fucking ride here, spinning around a bunch of supermassive celestial objects at the center of the galaxy. So seeing that human children innately believe in God or a God or just a higher power and that spirituality can be found in every human culture. It's not a single human band or peoples, doesn't matter what language they speak, what race they are, genetic components. They inherently have a spiritual or religious system that they adhere to. Whether it's animism, monotheism, whatever, they have an answer for where the origin of life is. Again, even if it's a turtle holding up the firmament of the earth or some celestial entity shitting out the planet, a bird hatching out, it doesn't matter how nonsensical it is, they still try to answer the question of where life came from. They still have an idea of forces beyond the control. And the hubris of modern science is that they think that everything is explainable, that even though we know that as humans, that there is something more than the universe that we innately can feel or perceive, that they're still confident that Things should be so easily boiled down to scientific facts. But what's scientific about the Big Bang? What's scientific about abiogenesis? I'll even say, what's scientific about our current knowledge? Because a lot of it's based on assumption. We're regularly proven wrong. I talked about the climate earlier, but I mean, after two dozen predictions of everything from degrading shorelines, sinking Pacific islands, three predictions of peak oil, four predictions of famine, predictions of a snowball earth, predictions that the ozone layer was going to evaporate, predictions that all the phytoplankton, all the reefs were going to die by 2020, predictions that, you know, the, the global uh, extinction rate will reach 60 fucking percent and we'll see like a mass extinction of megafauna. All of this shit. People talk about the lions and the elephants going extinct by 2018. I remember it all. I remember being in school. You're like, this is probably the last time you're ever going to see an Amor Leopard in, 20, in 2012. They're like, probably in the next five years, there won't be any more Amur Leopards. Motherfuckers regularly lied to us as kids. Regularly lied to us as kids and, and told us all kinds of bullshit. And you'll see this is why it's controversial to say a prayer in school, but totally not controversial to teach evolutionism as science. 
And it's not even from a thing where it's like, again, you remove all Sky Daddy Spaghetti Monster shit. You remove the entire Abrahamic faith from the argument, and you still see alternative theories that are just as valid being ignored. Like plasma cosmology, which I covered with Dave, uh, Professor Dave explains his ridiculous pure owl response to me. But the, the fact that like all of these al alternative combating theories to Big Bang, a frequency-based universe was an atomically-based universe, even then, even when they're just as material as one another, you still see a concerted effort to shill for Big Bang over plasma cosmology. There is no difference scientifically between plasma cosmology and the Big Bang, especially when we don't know that much about energetic phenomena. And again, like I said, the heliopause and our erroneous models over that, that decisively proved that we don't know as much about frequencies and energy and celestial phenomena as we think we do. Yeah, we're all going to die in the next five years to say that 100 plus years ago. You're like, we, we, we are five years away from... Like, remember during the Obama administration, like, we are five years away if we do not raise taxes and send all of our factories to Africa in the next decade, then the, the temperature will increase globally by one degree Celsius and the sea levels will rise 100 meters and they'll wipe out the Pacific Islands and Florida will be half underwater and you better vote for me. It's like, it's like the Green Party got Germany to shut down 23 nuclear reactors and make itself solely dependent on, on coal, brown coal especially, which kills a lot of people just by its extraction alone. And these Greens celebrated that shit like it was some major fucking victory when in reality it just fucked Germany when it came to the Ukraine war. And now they're telling people, oh, get an extra blanket. It's going to be a cold winter. And just... The sheer amount of retardation. The climate mongers are almost a completely different topic, but they're they're just as in bed. In fact, I think I think there's so much overlap between evolutionists and climate changers that I, I believe they're just one and the same at this point. I've never met an evolutionist that wasn't a climate monger and vice versa. I've never met a creationist or panspermian climate monger ever in my life. I've never met anybody who didn't believe in the Big Bang and evolutionism that was also like climate grifting. So I think it's pretty I think it's pretty apt that these motherfuckers talking about peak oil in the 70s and the 90s, talking about island sinking. Again, they, they told people in Final Watch to you'll have to leave. You have to go to Australia now, relocate to some reservation in Australia because your island's gonna be gone, so you guys gotta do it now. And they just were basically like, okay, we'll make preparations, but we'll leave when it's ready. And guess what never fucking happened? So they, they almost got away. Globalists almost got away with depopulating Palau and Vanuatu. Free fucking real estate. Can you imagine if they actually did that, if they actually voluntarily left? They would have never been able to come back. They would have never been able to come back. People don't understand that globalists almost snatched several Pacific Islands away from the people who lived there, and only because the people refused to leave until things actually happened. If they listened to the globalists, they would have had their lands literally taken from them by globalists and international con artists. They would have actually had their lands seized, free, free up for grabs by globalists who would have sold that shit wholesale. Be like Hawaii with all of Lanai owned by Larry fucking Ellison. You probably have like Mark fucking Zuckerberg or Justin Trudeau owning an entire island in the Pacific after deporting the entire fucking population because of climate change. So, yeah, go ask one of these guys. Go ask one of these guys who were, like, who were, who were told by globalists 15 years ago that your islands are going to be underwater, so you need to move to Australia. That shit was fucking rich. And I think even today, a lot of those people can recognize, like, yeah, nice try, guys. Nice try telling us to go to Australia. But even then... Even then, those guys saw through the bullshit. We're like, yeah, yeah, we'll move when we see uh, when we see things actually go bad. And that, like, really pissed them off. Because when nothing happened, when 2018 came and went, and 2020 came and went, 2022 came and went, you don't see any of that shit from Vanuatu anymore. You don't see anyone saying, like, oh, you're going to have to evacuate because the sea level's rising. Because they realized they were full of shit. It's almost, it's more than, all, literally almost five years after they told them that their island was going to go underwater, that... That shit still ain't even dropped a fucking meter under sea level.
In fact, many of those coastlines have actually gained, gained size from sedimentation deposits. So from actual beach building, they said it was going to fucking fall underwater. So that, that's where modern science is at. That's where modern climate change activists are at. They're here saying shit, and then the opposite ends up happening. So we now look at, again, some criticisms. So I've talked about creationism, the main flaw being the tail wagging the dog. It's begging the question. You're already looking at the world with the assumption that a single being created it. But the strength of creationism is, is that no other hypothesis currently explains the origins of life and the universe better than creationism. So believing the universe came about randomly, believing the universe is extra dimensional, unless you can point to an origin of existence from a multi multi dimensional angle. Once you peel back the layers, what created everything, what turned isn't to is you have to have some entity above the universe either some multi-dimensional or super-dimensional entity that could intelligently create the universe. Where does this entity come from? If he's above time, if he's above space, then intrinsically, you don't have to answer a when or where because it isn't beholden to a when or where. Any extra spatial entity is going to be above a time-space continuation, meaning that time and space are not factors. They exist nowhere and everywhere, in the future, in the past, and in all time. So that's what that is. Whether you believe in the extra-dimensional overlord or the benevolent sky father, these are the ways that we can best justify the origins of the universe that don't involve breaking the laws of physics. What does that mean? It means that if you take a being that's above space and time, they can do things beyond space and time to manifest space and time. You could also say that it is a phenomenon that did that. But in which case, how does a phenomenon actively order and reverse entropy? Hard to say. How does it even activate the process of entropy in the first place? Hard to say. What laid down the laws of our physics? Hard to say. Where did all the energy of the universe even come from if energy can't be created or destroyed? Hard to say. So again, creationism so far is probably the strongest way to explain the origins of space and time. However, the other strong way to look at it is multidimensional, thinking that other, universe may, other universes may have had a role in creating our universe, and that all those other universes were created from a long line of universes that, if not cyclical in nature, go back into perpetuity beyond space and time. Meaning that there is no one singular event that led to the multiverse, as long as there has been an is, the multiverse has been a thing. Which doesn't, again, explain the question. That just loops everything into one circle philosophically and is a bit... But they're both cheap outs. Because we just don't know. One's a cheap out because we say that the intelligent force creating our universe is beyond our universe. And the other is a chimp out because it says that a process that created our universe is beyond our universe. So again, like DZ says, what's the source of everything in existence? The source of everything is everything. The source of everything is everything. According to Big Bang people, the source of everything is everything. That the universe just expanded into its modern form and that all the energy was already self-contained. It doesn't explain the origins of that energy. It just says that the space and time itself expanded. That as time, ex as time expands, time, what we perceive as time marches on. And that time is just a factor of space, which is proven by Einstein, but that the expansion of space-time leads to, of course, the extension of time. Time goes forward because space is expanding, ergo. And we know this because of how gravity and mass manipulate not only the space around it, but also time. So what we see is that time moves slower near gravitational well. Where, t where space is expanding the slowest, we see that time is accelerating the slowest, or that time is just moving the slowest in general. But as we move away from gravitational bodies and go to where space is expanding the fastest, then we see that time is speeding up. This is why if you move at the speed of light, 
you'll be moving for one year at the speed of light and then the rest of the universe relative to you will be 20 years older. That's why that shit's a thing is because we know that time and space are intrinsically linked under both general and special relativity. So we know that any entity above time and space, it won't be a matter of where or when, but again, the source, what's the sauce? Is it deus ex machina? Is it like pan Gaiaism? Is it like the Gaia hypothesis where the earth is alive, where the, where life itself is conscious as one singular gestalt and progresses its own destiny. And that, that is a manifestation of nature somehow tying into some other theory or hypothesis. So the pan Gaiaists, they're strong in the sense that whatever you plug in to get life on Earth in the first place, pan Gaiaism or the Gaia hypothesis can now take over and say that life as a gestalt will lead and change itself beyond random gene mutation. That there's other things that influence life, the mana of life, the spirit of life, this animist principle that sees life direct itself down certain pathways using extra genetic meaning that beyond just genetics uh, and even epigenetics, life is directing itself down certain pathways. This is how you see a really bizarre correlation of convergence of entire ecosystems and niches. Why the hell is it that all of these Triassic archosaurs that are more related to crocodilians than dinosaurs appear to have all these convergences with dinosaurs? How is it that the same body shapes, the same builds, this, even a lot of the same colors and diets will manifest themselves in completely unrelated lineages. Kind of, kind of fucking insane if you think about it. But evolutionists say, oh, it's where it's all pressures in the environment. It's all these these pressures on these organisms. But again, the Pangaeus, they do a great job of filling in all the bullshit and all the holes that evolutionists perceive. Because again, like I said with the chimps, how do you have 40 million baseball differences between chimps and humans, 20 million on each lineage, and in 7 million years, randomly assuming that you could have 44 mutations per generation on average and reduce your chromosome count by, by one and still manage to end up being that different. How do you get there? Panspermius would say, oh, that's just the mana, the spirit of each branch leading itself to a different destiny or to a different form. And that might sound esoteric and retarded because we don't know the mechanism for how that happens, but it definitely explains better how things change and how animals speciate than just saying random gene mutation plus environmental pressures lead to this change. We know that random gene mutation is insufficient to explain the natural diversity on Earth because the impetus for evolution is not the environment, which is Lamarckism. It's not the environment. It's not the giraffe stretching its neck and getting its neck longer over time so it can reach the leaves, it's random gene mutation. It's your genome fucking up its replication process, and that fuck up happens in one of your sperm or in one of your ovum, and then you fucking skeet that shit into a receptive partner, or you get skeeted on or whatever, and that germ cell manages to germinate or manages to fuse to create a zygote, and that zygote becomes a baby, and that baby inherits a mutation. That's how mutation happens. And most time mutation happens in your body, it either becomes cancer in the form of benign or malignant, or it fucking does nothing. It becomes a freckle or some shit. Like, that's how most mutation happens. So the mutation in your body not only has to happen in one of your germ cells, which will become a gamete, the mutation also has to get passed on to the next generation. So the likelihood of a mutation even occurring in an individual is super low. Now, what happens when that individual is born? It's not just the mutation now happens. It now has to spread and fix in the population, meaning that now it has to spread to everybody. And so far, what we know, we can point to a handful of mutations that have had happened in the last 300,000 years of humanity's existence, from lactose tolerance to, to eye color. But where the fuck is the massive physiological changes to our bodies that you're trying to say has happened in other lineages in just as much time or, or less? If you're saying that it took... 10 million years for, for big cats and small cats to diverge that are saying in the same time frame the fucking lungfish can become an amphibian something's not checking out there bro something's not checking out if birds have been around for 160 million years then how the fuck do you go from a fish to a lizard in 40. same amount of time that that horses went from the size of a jack russell terrier to a clydesdale you're saying that 
fish can become iguanas? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? But if you think that from a pan guy's perspective, if you're looking at it from the guy hypothesis, it makes total fucking sense. Because it isn't just gene mutation leading to the development of life. It's the life itself. It's not the environment, but a deeper manifestation of life and its direction that is creating it. It's the spirit of life and the essence of life that's driving life's change and development forward. And each lineage has its own mana, has its own life force that's directing it down a certain destiny. Does evolution explain the behind, mechanics behind the mimicry? So mimicry, there's a few types of mimicry. There's cryptic mimicry, there's somatic mimer, mimicry, but aposematism is one where bright colors there's like Batesian and Malarian mimicry. One is the mimicry of two animals. One that is uh, poisonous and that all the other venomous or poisonous animals will adopt the same sort of color patterns to uniquely worn predators because what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And adopting more universally recognizable coloration is more sensible than trying to develop your own warning patterns. Uh, and then there's the other one where uh, basically are non-threatening or harmless or non-toxic species and you adopt the colors of more toxic species in order to kind of fit in. So evolution says that the creatures that naturally, uh, the mutants that end up being most similar in color to venomous or poisonous species ended up surviving and they proliferated. So they believe that was just plain old genetic drift. However, evolution does not explain how in the fuck certain species can get so similar to certain phenomena like looking like leaves and sticks and shit that just goes beyond like how certain flowers can look like birds like hummingbirds feeding from them like some of the shapes that plants and animals adapt in nature are literally beyond understanding there isn't a real reason why certain species of flowers should look like hummingbirds when they're from australia or there shouldn't be reasons why uh, certain animals end up looking exactly like other animals that are continents away just because of convergent evolution. Like, that shit's kind of crazy. How a thylacine can look just like a fucking wolf. I mean, mimicry is just a form of convergent evolution. If you really want to come down to it, it's just convergence. And remember what I say about convergences. Ap um, Synapomorphies synapomorphies for me, convergences for thee. So it's a synapomorphy. If it fits my hypothesis, if it fits my theories, fits my phylogenetic tree and my analysis, but it's only a convergence if it doesn't. So all the, we'll use parsimony to, to say that this descends from this to, and is related to this, but we'll cherry pick other shit to say that this other lineage isn't part of this because this, this, and this. And so by combining genetics and morphology, they've tried to use this, but a lot of it's just based off morphology. And that's why phylogeny is one giant fucking circle jerk and is utterly useless. Taxonomy is actually fairly useful. Phylogeny is just a bunch of evolutionist bullshitting. So mimicry, in reality, is just another form of convergent evolution, so to speak. That it's a result of similar patterns in nature achieving a better effect. If species already learned that yellow, black, and red means danger or toxic, than any other creature that happens to, let's say it's you have a, a frog that's normally green, but there's a morph that's yellow. Predators, because they know that bees are already associated with yellow, will avoid the yellow frogs. And there'll be more yellow frogs over time because predators avoid the color yellow. That's something where within a species, you can see microevolution push a frog species to becoming yellow rather than green. That's not, you know, that's not a bunch of fairy tale bullshit. That doesn't require a massive leap in. Uh, an idea. But what is kind of crazy is thinking that, oh, species X exists, and just because of convergence, they're going to look exactly fucking similar to another species, just, just because. That shit's fucking bananas. And thinking that that shit's a coincidence, that's where Pan Gaius are like, well, why do you think the dolphin body shape appears so many times? There's so many ways to, to adapt this, and it's not like seals and sea lions adapted a, a dolphin shape. The pinnipeds didn't suddenly become whales, but even the dugongs didn't even fully adopt this shape. I mean, they look very similar, but why didn't the manatees? Why do the manatees have the, 
flat tail. I mean, why didn't they get a more uh, streamlined shape like the dugongs? Oh, just because they're in more brackish water? It doesn't make sense. But then you look at even more similar convergent species, the thylacine and the, the wolf or the fox, rather, or even different lineages within a group. And it's like, how do these convergences even occur? Oh, they're just convergences, bro. Convergences. They're not related. It's just convergences. Hmm, I see. I see. So all these other things aren't convergences, even though they could easily just be convergences, too. I see. Catapult sermon mimicking the sound of ant queens in the colony at the Varga is just bonkers. Yeah, trust the science, bro. Trust the science, bro. Trust the science, bro. They just happen to one day get the sound right after practicing generation after generation. This is what's kind of bonkers is irreductible complexity, which I've talked about before, like with the flagellar motor, how you can't just evolve one part of the flagellar motor and be effective. It's like, unless you could perfectly mimic an ant queen, how the fuck would you ever even develop that in the first place? What, it just kind of works? Um, yeah, my internet's going. So there are multiple examples of irreductible complexity in nature that are just inexplicable to the evolutionists, but would make total sense if you believed in the Gaia hypothesis or even in the Anunnaki hypothesis of intelligent design, where life is monitored, uh, directly influenced or changed. Like after mass extinction, how do you explain the massive radiation of into the new niches? Natural fucking selection and random genetic change sure fucking don't because the timelines are so small. You can't just go from rat-sized animals to animals the size of fucking deer in just two million years. But we're seeing that in the fossil record. We saw that the ancestors of, of fucking ichthyosaurs are reaching titanic sizes in less time than it took for fucking sheep relatives to become whales, which is already fucking insane. But it's like five to eight million years you're already getting animals that are vastly different than the small diminutive ancestors that came before them. So from the Cambrian explosion to the aftermath of every single mass extinction, how do you get that massive radiation? Then the guy hypothesis or Anunnaki hypothesis really stand out compared to even creationism. Because the idea that some entity or force is actively fucking with the genetics of the planet or that some alien race is spending millions of years, collective eons, shepherding life on Earth or that life itself is shepherding itself, that's almost just as much of a, of a, that's just as convincing as either random change or sky daddy. And if the original religious people, they don't actually have to adopt that. This is the one strength that creationism has. There's no additives to creationism. You don't need like, cause the, the guy, the Gaius and the Anunnaki, they still need to explain the origins of the universe and life itself. And panspermia, again, is just kicking the can down the road. They, they can't explain anything after that. And then they have to rely on some other theory after panspermia, either because many panspermias are evolutionists that just don't believe in abiogenesis, but many of them are also either adhering to an Anunnaki hypothesis or the Gaia hypothesis for their theory. So panspermia is just a link in the chain. Many panspermias have to incorporate some other ideology and both the Anunnaki and Gaia hypotheses require some extra input, but both the materialists and the creationists both try to encompass everything into one umbrella. One, the creationists believe that the universe is ultimately from order, while the materialists believe that the universe is ultimately from chaos. So the materialists believe that the universe's origin is chaotic, that it came from randomness and random assemblage. Whereas the creationists believe that the universe came from order, that it was intelligently designed and directed by a creator. This is why creationism and evolutionism fall within a core dichotomy, but that within that dichotomy, you still have competing hypotheses. Whether this order, so let's say multi-universal, that is a belief in an ordered origin, but one that doesn't require a creationist. That is why Hawkins and Dawkins and Sagan, toward the end of their lives, started feeding into the multi, uh, multi-dimensional multi theory. Then there's the bounce theory, where the universe goes through cycles of expansion and contraction 
that creates a cyclical universe. So the big bounce came about because of mathematicians digging around, and they believe that the universe has always been eternally expanding and contracting. Again, how do you explain entropy? How do you explain the origin of the universe? It doesn't explain away entropy. So ultimately, they're trying to dance around the entropy question by finding a loophole, but that loophole doesn't exist. Still, at some point, entropy will increase, the heat of the universe will increase, and by our own measurements, the heat, the, there should be a heat death to the universe. But you don't know what dark energy is, you don't know what dark matter is, you don't know what's causing expansion in the universe, you're not even sure if what you're seeing is the reality. And that's just the case. The 40 demons do genetic uh, engineering experiments. Basically, yep, yep. Fourth dimensional demons makes just as much sense as either random change or a singular creator. And honestly, the big the big debate, the big gripe is honestly between creationists and the materialists. Of course, I bring in these competing hypotheses and alternatives because they need to be spoken out. You know, it, 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 this can't just be one tight, an unstoppable object, meeting, like what is it? The unstoppable force being the immovable object. It's like, this isn't just creationism versus evolutionism. There's multiple ways to skin this cat and to try to explain the origins of all life. But honestly, it's difficult. I really want to know what you guys think. Um, this critique, again, is just trying to trying to break things down and actually, actually generate some buzz in terms of some alternative hypotheses and theories to to materialism, because I find it to be very tantalizing to go through all the possibilities that exist that don't just involve random changes. Once you actually expand and open your mind to the possibilities, really anything is possible. And life could be as fucking wacky as the entire world being within some fucking mausoleum, like some fucking Necron collection floating in ether, and everything we know is just a fucking lie, that we're like canaries in a cage in some galactic menagerie, or we could be in a simulation, or we could all be living directed lives and everything's foretold and life is just one giant loop. But do you really believe life is random? Do you believe every, there's no meaning, deeper meaning to anything we're, we're all just randomly created? I just don't know. So DC says, I disagree with materialism because if the universe began from chaos, where the four fundamental forces come from. They imply order. So this is exactly what I was saying with entropy. How does the rock roll downhill if it wasn't placed uphill to begin with? On Earth, rocks are placed uphill either by tectonic forces or something uh, rose it up there or weathering happened. Something had to have that rock be uphill and then something had to push the rock so that it was rolling. So first the rock has to fucking get uphill in the first place, and then something has to get the rock rolling. What was that? The Big Bang says what got the ball rolling was the Big Bang. The universe started expanding for some reason. But it doesn't answer where the roll happened. The multiverse people say that the rock came from another universe, and that when it did so, it had enough momentum to start rolling downhill. So, like, the multiverse people think that a portal opened up on top of the mountain and a rock spewed out and that the rocks are rolling downhill. The panspermia people think the rock came from outer space. The rock's a meteor that hit the top of the mountain and then skid down to the ground and started rolling downhill after coming from outer space. The pangaeus believe that the rock was on top of the mountain and that a breeze came by and the breeze was strong enough to start the rock rolling downhill. Creationists believe that some dude either created the mountain or chiseled out the mountain or put the rock on top of the mountain and then gave it a gentle push and it started rolling down the mountain. However you believe the rock started rolling downhill, I believe the weakest of all of these hypotheses is the idea that the rock randomly got uphill and then randomly decided to roll downhill. It doesn't make sense. There's too much. There's too much in the way of that. There's too much that has to be assumed that goes way beyond even just us. You may have to make one assumption for a God to exist. You have to make one assumption for an alien race to exist. You have to make one assumption 
for life on a meteor to be a thing. And you have to make one assumption to think that life itself is a conscious entity rather than individual organisms. But you have to make multiple assumptions, make thousands of assumptions to go with a random view, a chaotic view on how the universe was assembled. I still very much think that evolutionism and materialism is the weakest, by far the weakest hypothesis or theory for how the universe got to where it is. I would rather listen to people in the Stone Age talking about motherfucking sky elk and random shamans from the ether. Like, you know, I'd rather listen to the Hawaiians talk about Wakea and Papa having sex and creating the fucking sky and earth and shit than listen to some dude talk about how everything randomly assembled itself. The rock has a will of its own to climb the hill when nobody's looking. Now that's a, that's Gaiaism. That's, that's the Gaia hypothesis. Kind of. That's, a, that's much more in the way of that. The, the conscious universe, the deus ex machina, the God within the machine. And I think deus ex machina actually, it's, t- it's still tied to the creationism, I think. So I don't, I think, I know that a lot of pan Gaius or that people will believe in the Gaia hypothesis or even pan spermia, they'll believe in that. They believe in the God within the machine. In fact, I, even a lot of Anunnaki people or people who believe that aliens did or extra dimensional beings, they believe in the God within the machine. They believe the universe itself is a deity and that life itself is being guided by these deities actions. That's why they believe the earth and the sky were both gods or that they have the, um, what, what's it, what's it called? Where the Sumerian goddess of chaos, that even chaos itself was an, was a conscious entity. Uh, what was her name? Um, Tiamat. Yeah. So the Tiamat hypothesis, I guess, is the opposite of the Deus Ex Machina, or even the Gaia hypothesis, where Tiamatism would be that chaos, that randomness is conscious. So I guess that would just be, isn't that just pantheism? At that point, yes. I guess at that point, yes. If you're, if you're, if you believe in Tiamat and you believe in Gaia and you believe in uh, like a sky father, then yeah, you're just a pantheist. But also pantheism before Abrahamic religions and Buddhism really took, took hold in society. I mean, Hinduism is still the third biggest religion on the planet besides Christianity and Islam and they're pantheists. So take that as you will. Usually they still believe the earth was created by a single de- deity or two deities or is a deity. So that is what it is. But remember, yeah, these hypotheses, even though they're ideologically condensed and reduced, ultimately do have their roots in paganism. Whereas most creationism, although it can have its roots in, in uh, polytheistic religions, typically uh, distinguishes itself by the fact that the earth is not a deity or doesn't come from a deity. So in many traditions, the earth is actually built from the remains of an entity, where in others, the earth is, so in Japanese tradition, the earth is believed to be from the body of an entity, which is also in some Austronesian traditions believed to be fish from the bottom of the ocean by Maui in the Polynesian tradition. So Maui has a magical hook and he throws it into the ocean to show off to his brothers. And when he pulls up or the Pacific islands. So yeah. And depending on what Pacific islands are colonized, it's said that he's pulled it up. So in most, in, in the wine tradition, he pulls up Hawaii. In the Maori traditions, he pulls up Aotearoa. In the Tahitian traditions, he pulls up Tahiti and the Marquesas. So it's like, he basically pulls up all the islands. But in most traditions, it kind of varies. Then you have dream time. Of course, that's almost a multidimensional theory or belief in higher planes. There's a Celtic belief in two planes, that when you die in this plane, you emerge in the other, and that they're interconnected and feed off one another, that they're cyclical as a duality. So there's actually many, many ways to approach this. Even looking at Native Americans, which blend a monotheistic singular creator God with animism, with the idea that even inanimate objects have some sort of consciousness. And so you see a lot of syncretism, you see a lot of diversity of ideas. Many, many cultures have a variety of explanations for life on earth that isn't just as simplistic as
Oh, man. All right, guys. My internet is going on the fritz again. And, yeah, I, I definitely wanted to squeeze this in as a Merry Christmas to those of you who have been waiting with bated breath to have me back. And I am back. But, in a sense, I never went away. So, as you can see, I'm still dealing with internet issues. But I'm still going to try to be consistent. I'm still going to try to upload. Like, my uploads have all been getting interrupted. But I'm still going to try to upload. I'm not giving up on YouTube. And I'm not giving up on streaming. Um, but, yeah, dudes, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, DZ. Thanks the, for the other people I see lurking in my uh, lurking in my chats. I, I see you. I can, I can see everyone who's, who's here. So, Merry Christmas to y'all, too, even though you're too afraid to speak up. But... Uh, yeah, I I really think it's great. I hope that you guys have a great Christmas, great holidays, fantastic 2024. Just want to let you bros know that we're going to make it, that I'm trying to follow my dreams. And even though I'm spending Christmas alone, it's depressing, that I'm doing the job that I wanted to do after having a shitty red pilling experience at my last job, having to eat some humble pie, live with family, and now I'm living fairly comfortably, doing my thing with shit internet, but doing what I wanted to do since I was in my undergrad. So if you guys focus and you keep your mind and your goals clear, you can achieve anything. But what I principally wanted to do on the internet, one of the first things I ever did on the internet, besides that interview with Drexel, was to come out and really try to get people to think critically. Like think about where you are in life and be thankful for the things you have and strive to gain and aspire to go beyond the things that you don't. Like, one thing I know for sure is that winners never quit and quitters never win, guys. Life's going to be a shit sandwich. It's not going to work out. Like, look at me. I'm getting no pussy right now, bros. I'm living in a fucking trailer. But I'm making the most of this shit because this, this is still great. I'm still having a great time. Internet shit? Fuck it. I'll, I guess I'll just vlog. I don't care. Can't you share screen, fucking stream cuts out. But just as things get stormy, things clear up too. So I hope this new year is great for all you guys. I hope you guys can fulfill and make some decent resolutions, drink some eggnog, you know, watch some big titty elf hentai. You know, the, the good old things that we do on the holidays to commemorate and show our appreciation and love for the things that matter most. So yeah, guys, I'm really thankful for all my viewers. I can't believe I've actually gotten over... 100 subs in just this year alone from 2023. I don't know. I didn't know I was ever going to reach that milestone. So this is my 61st, I guess, video or whatever that's going up on my channel. I have 108 subscribers as of making this stream. And I actually never thought I would get this far. I mean, it sounds sad as fuck, but like I never even thought I'd reach a triple digit number of subs. I thought I'd be talking to myself for the next five years. But I appreciate everybody who's come by. I appreciate everyone who's joined the Discord or participated, sent in chats. And yeah, I, I wish everyone the best. I know that life is life is tough right now for a lot of people. A lot of y'all, uh, the holidays is not a good time, but I know for sure that if you stay focused, if you stay positive, if you have light in your heart, I don't care where the fuck it comes from. If it comes from fourth dimensional uh, alien demon creatures or if it comes from god or if it comes from uh some random bursts of chemical activity in your heart then i want you guys to keep that light alive and remember to let it shine and also epstein didn't kill himself and uh yeah remember to remember to vote next year too i think this year is a a big election year let's uh let's have a good game not burn down too many cities this time and uh yeah there's only two genders man and a woman uh and speaking of uh modern women are shit write a prenup if you're gonna get married this year i know some of you niggas are out here lurking so dz's voting with his wallet that's right goyim better uh verify that tax return all right uh i, I see uh, that my credit score is already getting declined my credit score is in the 600s now because i said that but yeah, folks, have a great time. Have a great, wonderful holiday season. Get shit faced on New Year's. You know, talk to a girl, touch some grass. You know, stop listening to all these man and spare niggas telling you to avoid women. Look at some bitches. 
give her the eye a little bit, you know, she calls you a creep, fuck it, run away before she can call the police. Do your thing, bros. Whatever you feel like you need to work on in your life, whatever hobbies you feel like you ditched, whatever people you feel like you should talk to, do it, bro. If you have a girl you're crushing on, go go ask her out. If you have a movie you want to see, you know, drop the drop the money. If you hate your fucking boss, like go start looking for another job. Like do these things that seem uncomfortable, that seem impossible, and you can go ahead and get ahead in life. All right, folks. I'm at an hour and a half in this stream. The internet's already fucking cutting out. Zuckerberg's coming for me. Elon Musk is telling me that's enough. He has bigger shit to do than give me bandwidth. So, again, medically, Kamaka, it's great here from y'all. Hope to see you next week. Uh, and if I will, I will post it in the Discord. So, see you, DZ. Real ones, day ones. Thanks to everybody. And again, if you have any suggestions, any responses, any ideas, feel free to leave a like, feel free to leave a comment, feel free to leave a dislike. I don't give a shit. If you want to bring some heat to the stream, feel free to drop it. I don't care if it's hate. I don't I don't care if it's unrelated. Like, I'll bring your shit up. You don't have to super chat me shit. If you actually come here and comment, you're going to get lit up. That's my guarantee to you. Until this shit gets so hot where I can't literally highlight every single comment, you're going to get put up for real. So feel free to comment. Feel free to drop in. But most importantly, take care of yourselves and have a great time. Happy holidays, everybody, and peace out.